Morning, everybody. How you doing? It's good to be with you. Good to have you here. Folks online, how you doing? My name is Marsh. And if we haven't met, I am the worship arts pastor here. And we're in week four of our build series. We are looking at the building blocks of faith. And we have been working through those. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we have been asking a question in a way to dive into a conversation about these building blocks. And they've been pretty big, pretty big questions so far. Who is God? Um, what is worship? Gus tackled last week, uh, why do I pray? So some really daunting questions, not ones that are easily answered with a sentence or two. This week's question is, when do I worship? Now, I have actually tried to answer this question with just a sentence, and I think I nailed it. So when do I worship? Every day, everywhere, in everything. Every day, everywhere, in everything. We worship God all the time and with everything we've got. Right on? Well, well, yeah. But we're not just going to step there. We're going to develop that a little bit because it begs some more questions. Like, Marsh, what does that mean to worship God every day, everywhere, and with everything? And how does that play out in my life? And those are fair questions. And we're going to go after those together and unpack them a little bit and dive into them. We're going to do it together. And we're going to start with Scripture so that we have a good place to start and a little bit less chance to get lost along the way. So why don't we stand up together? We're going to read this couple of verses from Romans 12. And we're also going to have a couple more times in here where I'm reading some scripture. And as we do, I'm not going to have us stand up every time. If you'll just remember the attitude of your hearts right now and our posture. Here's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You can have a seat. So what does this mean? And before I get going, um, I just want to say something. I'm, I'm not a teacher. I didn't study how to do this. It's not my gig. It's not my gift. But it is my privilege today to enter into this with you, and uh, my goal is that I would make sense, and that uh, I would lift up God's way above our way, and that we might leave here knowing something that we didn't know before. So here we go. This is how I understand it. To worship God truly and properly, as the verse says, we need to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice and renew our minds. Now, these things really work together in tandem, so we're going to look at them uh, individually. Living sacrifice, says Paul. Now normally, when we talk about sacrifice, especially in the Bible, something dies. Uh, you get an animal, you take it to an altar, you place it on the altar, and then that, that animal is put to death as a payment for sin. And Paul refers to a living sacrifice here. So he's not talking about bloodshed, which is really great for us because I have an aversion to that. And fortunately, and miraculously, our sin debt has been paid in full already. Jesus has paid that price, and I think anytime we talk about that, we should probably say, thank you, Jesus. So, thank you, Jesus. So then, what is this other thing that Paul is talking about? Well, it turns out that there's another kind of sacrifice, and it's one that we make we still, there's still something that goes to the altar and then gets up on it, and it's us. Except we get up there and we live there. It's not a sacrifice of blood. It's a sacrifice of action and a sacrifice of will and a sacrifice of way. We sacrifice the questions like, what do I want to do for what would you have me do? What would further my plans to what is it that would further your plans? Or the question, who do I want to be, for the question of who is it that you say 
I am. Basically, it's seeing the death of what I think is best and living for what God deems as best. And that's worship. It's taking God and placing him in the king seat of our hearts. It's choosing his way over our way, placing it in the highest place and doing that over and over and over again. And that's why the answer to our question of when do I worship is every day, everywhere, and in everything. Because we're about to find out, we worship all the time. Either God or something else, because we are made to worship, hardwired for it. We can't help it. So getting right the object of our, worp- of our, perp- of our worship is paramount, and we have to do it over and over again. And there's a big reason, a big reason, why the, of the over and overness of it. There's a reason why we continually check to make sure Jesus is in the king seat of our heart, and it's because we're practicing. We're practicing to become. So I studied classical music in college, which might be interesting to you. I studied classical singing. I even paid like some of my rent by being uh, the soloist in an Episcopal church. Now, I wasn't Episcopalian, but they were paying money, and I was 20. And I did that. And I even sang with some chamber orchestras. It's crazy. It's like a, it's a, it's a world away. I sang Bach and Brahms and Schubert. And if you know or if you don't know, to become good at classical music, you have to develop a technique. Whether you play the piano or sing. Because as a singer, you have to be able to focus your tone in such a way that it will either cut through or lift above an orchestra and be heard. So a lot of my schooling had to do with studying with a vocal instructor. Now one caveat, when you probably think of studying, it means something different to you than it does to me. I was a horrible student. And so studying to me really just meant I went and met with my vocal instructor and then did nothing with it. Um, And to develop a technique, whether it is singing or typing or anything, you have to practice it. It comes to you by repetition to be ingrained in you, so it's second nature. And I wasn't doing this, and so it probably won't come to a shock to you that I was not improving my technique. Well, it became the summer before my junior year, and the junior year is your first big year as a music major. You get to do your junior recital. So I went away. I had an opportunity to go work at a gift shop, and you might think that doesn't sound like a really cool opportunity, but this gift shop was at the National Music Camp in Interlochen, Michigan. And I had a friend whose mom was teaching voice there, and she wasn't just teaching voice there. She was one of the preeminent vocal instructors in the United States at the time. And she said she would teach me if I came, so I went. And I would work a shift at this gift shop called the Scholar Shop. So I would work at the Scholar Shop for a shift, and then I would go take a lesson, and then I would practice and practice. And you might wonder why I practiced there and I didn't practice back at school. Well, the atmosphere was a little bit different. Um, It was the National Music Camp. So a bunch of junior high schoolers and high schoolers would audition to come to this place, and they were amazing, amazing. Uh, And when you would walk outside, it was in this forest, so you walk outside and there was just music everywhere. They took their lessons and they practiced, and so you would just hear trumpets, and you would hear violins, and you would hear pianos, and you would hear guitars and singing, and it was inspiring. And they were high schoolers, and I wasn't going to let them whip me, so I practiced. I'd take my lessons, and I would practice, and I practiced, and practiced, and practiced, and that was my summer, I, I, and that was my lifestyle. And then I went back to school, and I had my first lesson with my voice teacher, Fritz, and isn't that the perfect name for a voice teacher? Fritz. And so I sang for Fritz, and Fritz heard me, and he thought the difference was night and day. And he said, Marsh, you are a different singer. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
We are practicing to become. I needed to practice to become a singer whose technique was in tune with its purpose. And that's what we're talking about here, practice. These words in Romans are not for us just to know, but they're for us to put into practice so that we can become. So how does that work itself out in our everyday? Well, we're going to look at a couple different ways it does. And one is in our relationships. Ephesians 5.21 says this, Submit yourselves to one another out of reference to Christ. Now, this is a part uh, of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, and he is getting ready to kind of give a whole lot of information as to how the Christian life might work itself out in a household. And this is the first verse, and it's his main point, which is serve one another. So let me read it again. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence to Christ. Do you hear how that is almost automatically worship themed? If I were to take it and tease the language out a little bit, put the front and the back and the back in front, it might sound like this without changing the meaning. Because you hold Jesus in such high regard that you would change your actions for his better way, reverence to Christ, serve one another as unto God. And that is worship. Trading or sacrificing our way, yielding to God's way, equals worship. It's putting God in the king's seat of our heart, and we need to practice that and practice serving one another so that we can become. And just in case you were thinking, and you know that this is right before Paul starts talking to husbands and wives and dads and how dads aren't supposed to exasperate their children, then you would think maybe this is just for families, but it's not. This is a universal theme in the Bible. Paul says again in, in Romans, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And even Jesus says in John, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than he who would lay his life down for his friends. I had a buddy named Stan Endicott who in um, my 20s, before I got married, really was a mentor kind of guy to me. And I would call him from time to time to get some advice. Uh, or I might even call him if I was having a difficult time with, with someone or in a relationship. And when I would call him with that kind of question, he would always give me this answer. Marsh, you need to serve that person. Because if you do, if you care for that person's well-being, it will change your heart for that person. And in the, and in the midst of that, it'll make you a little bit more like Jesus. And Stan was right. Stan had known Jesus a whole lot longer than I had, and he'd been practicing to become longer than I have, and he learned this thing from the same place that Paul learned it, from the foot-washing Jesus who said, I have not come to be served, but to serve and give my life. So that's one way in our relationships and how we serve one another. Another way, we can worship God in the everyday and the everything, and the everywhere, is in our work, or in our doing. Colossians 3, 16, 17, and 23 says this, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, and as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as unto the Lord. Now let me share something with you. It's a phrase that I'd love for us to try to remember. Maybe not word for word, maybe not verbatim, but let's get the gist of it. God is glorified and praised in our work when it is done unto him. God is glorified and praised in our work when it is done unto him. And this is not something I think of all the time, which is pretty sad because the implications, the ripple effects, the ramifications it has are huge. And when I say work, I don't just mean our jobs. I have a buddy in Texas, in Houston. And you will almost never catch this guy driving by himself. He takes some with, someone with him everywhere he goes. If he goes to the grocery store, he's taking somebody with him. He takes somebody with him to the gas station. If he's picking you up at the airport, 
It's not just you two. There's somebody else there. And when I call him and he's in his car, he'll answer it like this. Hey, man, I'm just in my car and I'm with Mike or whoever who's with him, his daughter or whomever. And so I asked him one time, man, why, are you, why do you always have somebody in your car? And he said, well, he knew exactly what I was talking about. And it's not, he said, ministry, I believe, is done in relationship. And if you got somebody with you, you never know what God might do. So he's found a way to serve people and worship God with his driving time. He's worshiping God with his truck every day, everywhere, in everything. This thought, this truth, is, it could change the li- your life. Every minute we have an opportunity to worship God and to glorify him. I wonder, has God ever given you an idea of how you could do that in your everyday life? God gave me one this morning. And it really was this morning. I was not able to share this last night because I didn't have this. So lots of Saturdays I don't sleep very well because Sundays we have 7.30 rehearsal here. And then I, I need a whole bunch of other time just to, you know, worry. So I woke up really early this morning, 3.47, because I looked at my phone. And I lay there looking at the ceiling, and I had this thought. Marsh, next time you and Lori and the girls are rummaging through your closets looking for stuff to take to goodwill, praise me. Worship me. Worship God. And I had this this picture in my mind that I was holding a shoe, one of my shoes, and I, that, I should, that I should spend some time praising God for his provision in my life. He gave me this shoe. It's really helped me out. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to give it to goodwill. So, Marsh, I want you to pray for the person that might next wear that shoe and for my provision in their life and that they might somehow know me one day maybe because of this shoe or because of this prayer every day, everywhere, in everything. And just as an aside, now that we're talking about what worship is and how it could look, I know I'm the worship guy here, the music guy. And a lot of times when we talk about church services, we say things like, I really like the teaching and the worship. Worship isn't just sung. In fact, it's, it's rarely the whole bag. Most of worship is lived. And this beautiful hour that we have together here every week, and I'm very thankful for it, it's just one 168th of our week. 167 more hours are just waiting to make known the glory of God who we tell people is our everything. So let me say a prayer for us all right now. God, would you let all of our 168 hours this week tell of who you are and the wonder of your never-ending love. Amen. Every day, everywhere, in everything. So praise God with the truck. and Praise God with the shoes. And if you're a student... You praise God with the studying. And if you write songs or you're a journalist, praise God with the writing and praise God with the bus driving. And Britt, praise God with the landscaping. And later on today, I'm going to be praising God with the mowing of the grass. Amen. And praise God on the bass, Louie. Right on. Hey, Michelle's going to come and sing for us a song. It's kind of an underscore of what we've just been talking about. And I wonder, as you let it kind of wash over you, if you would take a minute to pray for God to give you a vision of what it would be like to worship him in your relationships and what you put your hand to.
Let's pray. Dear God, may all of my life tell of who you are and the wonder of your never-ending love. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. We put you, Jesus, in the king's seat of our hearts and live our lives in reverence to you and how we relate to others and how we serve and how we work. Amen. Well, we could go home right now because we've got plenty to work on um, and how we worship and glorify God in our relationships and how we serve one another and in what we do. But I'd like to talk about one more piece before we sing some more songs together, and it's pretty central. It's key. And it's this. How do I worship God in private? with my life when I'm alone, when no one sees me, when I'm online, or just in my thought life, that's a tough one. It seems like there's always a war going on up there, that there's just a battle for supremacy up there. Let me read Romans for you one more time. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our minds? How do we make our minds right again? How do we make them new? And is there something... Is there something amiss with our minds? Here's what Romans 1, 22, 23 has to say. Although they claim to be wise, and we're they here, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. Remember earlier when I talked about uh, how we're made to worship hardwired to do it and we're gonna worship no matter what and that we've got to get the object of our worship right over and over and over again, this is why. Because we in our brokenness have decided to trade worshiping the glory of God for glorifying ourselves. That is sad but true. We've got to renew our minds and get the object right again. And trading the lies we have come to embrace for the truth we have turned aside. We gotta flip that script, y'all. We need to embrace the truth, not the lies. Now how do we embrace the truth? We gotta seek the truth and know the truth. It's why last week, Gus taught us about the importance of prayer so that we might have community with God and know more intimately and innately his voice. And next week we dive into reading scripture so that we can know God's word for ourselves and better distinguish his path for his children and how he has so lovingly rescued us from a life without him. And when we have a knowledge and understand the truth, then we have a chance up here. 2 Corinthians 10, three through six says this. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, I'm not going to jump into spiritual warfare here for a long treatise, but I do want to say one thing. This is saying 
that when we worship God, when we glorify God, strongholds of the enemy are broken. Amen? I mean, I came from Kentucky, so we always said amen and preach at Marsh and ride on bro, that kind of stuff back here. So amen? amen? All right. So we are fighting with worship. Worship drives back the darkness. And if you don't know that, if you didn't know that, it's, it's going on right now. And I just wanted to let you know that's what's up. So let's keep going. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So this battle for supremacy in the mind, it's not a joke. It's really going on. It just got validated here in the scripture. And also we've been given a, a game plan for how to combat it for how to worship God in our thought life, and it's called taking thoughts captive. And what is that? Well, I've tried to define it here. It's realizing in a moment, or being prompted by the Holy Spirit in that moment, that my thoughts are not aligned with Christ's best for me, and then taking those thoughts and speaking truth to them, or as the scripture says, by making it obedient to Christ. So when somebody cuts me off on the street, what do I do? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> because I already, it happens instantaneously. I've already decided, I don't like you. You are a horrible person. You probably don't have any friends. And your mom's probably a mean old lady. And I'm going to drive up next to you and give you the mean face, the shame face of just, hmm. Because I've decided that you and I are never, ever going to like each other. And you're laughing because you know I'm right. And it all happens in about two seconds. So then what do I do with this big old glob of thoughts that just came up into my mind? I arrest them and I speak truth to them. I say, I'm a new creature in Christ. And so are they, or at least they have the opportunity to be. And with all the grace and mercy I've been shown, surely I can muster some grace and mercy for this person in this moment. And so, God, would you please bless bad driver person right now and allow me to be a light for you in my car, and maybe they'll be a light at their destination when they get there. There's so much that happens up here. It doesn't even have to be a moment like the one I described. It might just be fighting old wounds. You find yourself in that place again where voices are just echoing around your head the sound of you're not worth it. You got to take that thought and tell it the truth. God reached through eternity to show his love for you. He showed me my worth by his actions and you've been chosen by him, you're wholly his and beloved. And if you've ever been in any counseling, you know that by doing that once, it's not the cure. It's a practice that leads further and further into health, just as this leads further and further into a mind renewed. Did I say this would be easy? This is not. And I sit up here in front of you as someone who doesn't have this all done. I have not attained this, but this is worship. We are practicing to become. I've said that a few times today, and here's what I mean by that. Just as I practiced, just as I practiced good singing technique to become a singer who has good technique, I need to practice serving my wife in a reverence to God to become a man who serves his wife as worship. I need to practice reading God's word to become a person who knows God's word. I need to practice praying to become a man who has community with God. I need to practice working as unto the Lord to become a person who worships in his work. And I need to practice renewing my mind to have a renewed mind. Does that make sense? We are practicing worshiping God with our lives so that we have a life that worships God. I'd like to invite the, the band back up. I'm going to do a little more singing. 
But as I invite them back up, I want to invite us into something. I was having a conversation with my friend Teresa, who's on staff here uh, in our worship department. And she's really great. What a great resource she is. And um, I was sharing a story with her that inspired us both into something we're going to share here in just a second. I don't know if you've heard of the pastor Craig Groeschel, but he leads a church called Life Church in Oklahoma, and it's actually all over, all over the place now. It's a really, really big deal, and, and our family loves this guy. And we listen to his teaching, and he's, he's kind of a little bit of a, you know, a preacher in our lives, and, and we, um, we follow him as a great leader. And uh, he desires to live a life of worship in all whole different um, pieces of his life. And one of those is technology. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the YouVersion Bible, the YouVersion app. Um, you might have it on your phone. 60 million people do. That's one way he has tried to use technology um, to worship. And another way is the piece that really took me and that I shared with Teresa. It's this. He has accountability software on his devices just to make sure that he doesn't get lost in his thoughts while he's online because it's pretty easy to do that and his reasoning is this why would I not do something today that would keep me from sinning tomorrow and Teresa heard that and she said why would we not do something today with our phone that might help us worship tomorrow so we've asked you to do this text-in thing before. Texting into the number 97000, 97,000. I'm going to ask you that again, to text the word everywhere to 97,000. Nothing before, everywhere, nothing after it, no quotation marks, no parentheses, just one word, everywhere, to 97,000. And when you do that, you will opt in to receiving for the next week, three or four times a day, scripture in a text it'll just pop up on your phone it might pop up on your phone um, while you're online it might pop up on your phone while you're driving don't check that one until you reach a safe destination it might pop up on your phone while you're with your kids or it might be the first thing you read in the morning but it's meant to be a catalyst for worship that you would take a moment and remember that there's a God who loves you and we need to put his way above our way. And maybe, maybe the scripture won't even resonate with you in that moment. It'll just be that moment that you go, oh yeah. I think I do know somebody who this is resonating with right now. And you serve that person and worship God by lifting them up in prayer. So we're going to sing a little bit here. I, just take a little bit of time. And maybe go ahead and Opt into that on your phone right now while we wait. Do something today that might lead us to worship tomorrow. <laughs> 